Well, thank you, Chair, and thank you to all of you for having chosen to hold such an important meeting here in the European Parliament. One of my very first experiences in politics was as a young candidate in an election in the west of Scotland, where I come from. And I was invited to address in the campaign a meeting rather like this. And I was extremely nervous and I turned to the chairman and I said, Chairman, how long should I speak for? And he replied, well, you can speak for as long as you like, young man, but we leave here at two o'clock. <laughs> it was one of the best lessons I've ever had in politics. Ladies and gentlemen, I will try to be brief. You are right to argue that a Copenhagen deal focusing on carbon to the exclusion of water is a deal only half done. The world grapples with the oncoming impact of climate change and we've got to get the basics right. We've got to ensure that the adaptation measures and the mitigation measures that we need to ensure the fair distribution of fresh water supplies are there because the alternative is a future in which drought and floods lead to a new generation of local conflicts and cross-border tensions over clean water. When I was at school, one of the first poems I was asked to read was a poem by an English poet called Samuel Taylor Coleridge. And it was a poem called The Ancient Mariner. And it talked about the plight of a group of people aboard a ship in the middle of the ocean with no fresh water supplies left and only salt water around them. And it spoke movingly of the despair these people felt at having, as the poet said, water, water everywhere, but not a drop to drink. The problem is not a lack of water in many places. It's a lack of drinkable water, a lack of usable water, and that's what we've got to deal with. Because water is essential for human survival. The guarantee of vital human rights as recognized by the UN Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. And in fairness, the availability of clean water has improved over recent decades. The proportion of people in developing countries with access to clean water has risen from 30% in 1970 to around 84% in the early years of this decade. But we have a moral predicament. And the moral predicament can be summed up like this. In Tunisia today, 2.1 million people live without adequate drinking water. In Zimbabwe, it's 2.5 million people, and in Sudan, it's a staggering 12.3 million people. But in Bahrain, things are rather different. The new city between the desert and the pale blue sea uses more water per head of population than anywhere else in the world and 97% of it derived from desalination plants. It's the most expensive water in the world, too. And while Bahrain is busy planting millions of bedding plants, sustained through drip irrigation, this garden in the desert represents literally just what money can buy you, while elsewhere in the world, over a billion people are without access to sufficient clean drinking water and two and a half billion without access to adequate water for sanitation. That is a moral predicament with which we must grasp. It's a vivid illustration of what the United Nations called in a report in 2006, uh, a core issue of governance, when they wrote that there is enough water for everybody, but that water insufficiency is often due to mismanagement, corruption, lack of proper institutions, bureaucratic inertia, a shortage of investment both in human capacity and in physical infrastructure. And that shows why we need 
institutions like the IMF and the World Bank to be investing in the necessary infrastructure, to be working with the many excellent NGOs around the world who are developing the kind of intermediate technology that can work. But it also shows why we need better parliamentary oversight of the institutions of global governance to get their priorities right. Climate change is an added threat. It will make the old solutions insufficient on their own. And we're going to need to find new ways of fighting the battle for water. And I am pleased on behalf of the Liberals and Democrats in this House to pledge our support to redouble efforts in this way because we believe that access to water should be a basic human right. How can we do it? Well, firstly, let's change the mandates of the current institutions, putting climate change concerns at the heart of their mission and their work. Second, let's look at setting up a single international institution designed to intervene and manage the supply of water where there is either conflict or unforeseen shortages so that we no longer rely on ad hoc management of trans-border water resources. That agency, maybe a UN agency, could work hand in hand with the IPCC to forecast the impact of climate change on water resources, to map a way around the shortages, where the international community should invest in water treatment, in septic systems, in water transport, and ways of, supply, of purifying water supply. Certainly, we've got to ensure that water is factored in to future global climate change agreements, because after all, human survival is the core purpose of those agreements. So I congratulate you on your efforts in this regard. I ensure you of my support and those of my colleagues. And I applaud the, way you, the efforts you are making to make policy makers aware of the scale of the problems that we face and consider new approaches to tackling it. Never before has your work been so vital? Thank you.